What Happens in the Woods is a true crime podcast. We discuss events that are often violent in nature. Listener's discretion is advised. The phrase, it is God's will, has been used for hundreds of years in order for people to absolve themselves for the sins they commit. In 1997, in a small coastal town in Washington, the religious community suffered a loss of one of their own that would shake the very foundation of Christ Community Church. Don Hackney, the youth pastor's wife, was murdered one day after Christmas and left to perish in a fire at her home. No one would know for years just how much more was involved in that murder and how many lives were affected, nor would anyone guess that a love triangle was at the root of it all. Join us for our Season 2 finale episode as we talk about the murder of Don Hackney and the numerous emotional and sexual abuses that took down a church in the small community of Bremerton, Washington. This is What Happens in the Woods with your host, Jess and Bryce. Let's get started. Hi, friends. Welcome. We have made it to the final episode in our second season. Are you, how you feel about it, Bryce? Fine. Fine? Just fine? fine. Ready to be done? No. Oh. Okay. I can't be done. You can't be done? As long as my wife wants to record, I have to edit. Oh, Okay. <laughs> But what's funny is I did the entire episode last time on my own, mm. so. I'm fired? <laughs> N- no. Oh. No. Dang it. Uh, any, any updates? What magical words do you have for us today? Abracadabra. Any updates? Uh, Australia's still in the lead. Thank you, Australia. Yeah, for sure. And then I saw Germany had come up, so. And then somebody else. Who else is next? I didn't see that far down. Oh, you're not. Okay. All right. Fine. All right. So any other updates? Uh, No. No. Okay. So look, I had promised that there would be some merch and that we've been getting the info out. Well, what had happened was, yeah, yeah, we ordered some samples before Christmas And they weren't perfect. The color was off. It was more pink than red. And that's fine. We thought we had fixed it and, you know, we were good to go. And then since then, we've washed a couple different, like the sweatshirt and T-shirt. And it doesn't wash well. And (laughs) I'm not happy with it. So until we get that figured out, um, there's no merch. I... Not that everybody was just clamoring to get out this stuff, but I would hate for somebody to spend their money on something and then it turned out to be shit. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I was pissed enough that I bought the sample and spent my money on it yeah. and it turned out to be shit. <laughs> so I, I just am not comfortable with putting it out there and I was kind of on the fence already about it. So there, there's no merch right now. We're and, looking for new vendors. Yeah, we're we're looking at how to do it and do it the right way and just make it something that's not going to cost a bunch of money if you guys want it, but it's also not going to deteriorate after three washes. Yes. So, so, yeah. So some dates to keep in mind for all of you. This is our finale of season two. So What the Fuck Wednesdays will be starting February 17th. Our... One year anniversary, or as Price called it the other day, our potiversary <laughs> is also coming up. That's February 21st. I can't believe we've actually been doing this for a year now. It's kind of yeah. crazy. Yeah. Um, as a way to say thank you, we have a giveaway that we're planning and we'll announce it on that day. But there's also going to be kind of a special recap episode released on that day. Keep in mind, this is not a Friday that this release is on. I think it actually ends up being a Saturday. So, um, 
little little bit different. Just keep in mind we'll we'll put information about that out there. And then last but not least, April second will be the first episode in season three. So, Yay. So mark your calendars, people. Um of course, as always, if anybody has any case suggestions, you know how to reach us on the social media. It is not too late. We're still researching what the fuck stories and season three cases and I would love to hear any suggestions that anybody has. Any anything. Yeah. Yeah. Keep in mind, um, WTF is anywhere. doesn't have to be Pacific Northwest. We are keeping the episodes for the seasons in the Pacific Northwest at this time. Um, that might change in the future, but at this time, we're still kind of here. All right. Are we ready? Let's do it. Okay. We're here to talk about a very strange involved love triangle. I, I maybe would even call this a love rectangle because of all the people involved. Okay. It also inv- involves a murder, but the murder is actually the beginning of the story. So what I am about to tell you would actually make a really good soap opera or like Jerry Springer two part episode. Yeah. Uh, if Netflix did this and they got it right, they could have a, like another Tiger King saga on their hands. For sure. I think so. I think this is a very missed opportunity for somebody to to turn into. Yeah, there's just there's so much. I want to add that there's a lot of personal opinion I'm going to try to keep out. It's very hard. It was very hard. So I read a book for my primary. um, I read a book for my primary source of info. There are plenty of other news reports and court documents that I found. So that's not all I'm going off of. And I promise I didn't do this on purpose, but the book I read was called A Twisted Faith by Greg Olson. And for those who are in the know, we covered a case that was another Greg Olson book for our season one finale on Michelle Notek. Mm -hmm. I didn't do that on purpose. I, I didn't. He just has these really interesting cases that he's written about and I, I couldn't help myself. All right, so I'm going to do things a little differently this time. I'm going to tell you right away. It was the husband that did it. There's no guessing. All right, end of episode. Thank you, everybody. Yep, thanks, everybody. Great season. Um, Nick Hackney was convicted and is currently serving time at the Monroe Correctional Complex here that's in the state of Washington for the murder of his wife. And I'm going to add more on the trial, uh, the conviction, and the sentencing later on. There's a lot of sort of details that I felt it was just better to get right into everything. So Don and Nick had met at the Northwest College of the Assemblies of God and were soon exclusively dating. A close friend claims Don told her that she knew he was the one. And a few people weren't really sure why that was, because there's just really to look at him. There's nothing really special going on there. From every account that I read, Dawn was a bright and lovely young woman who was, uh, she was top of her graduating high school class. She was valedictorian. She um, actually in 1983, I believe, had made it to the White House and won the National Spelling Bee. Um, so she was definitely a, a bright, educated woman, right? Yeah. Nick wasn't really what anybody would consider a catch, um, but many people claim that he was just well liked. He was outgoing. He was kind of the, you know, goofy friend, but he was also very charismatic. The two married April 20th, 1991, and they were soon living in marital bliss, but it was short lived bliss. Maybe not bliss at all. Yeah. Don was murdered the day after Christmas in 1997, and a fire started in the master bedroom that destroyed much of the couple's home. In a later confession to one of his lovers, it is said that Nick had suffocated Don with a plastic bag, who had been given multiple doses of Benadryl. That killed her. Um, it, he said that he looked her in the eyes as he did that. That was this person's claim that he told them that. Okay. So to cover his tracks, he staged the fire that would eventually burn down their bedroom um, to absolutely nothing. There was just not much left. And then he left on a hastily planned hunting trip. He made sure that he had important documents towards the front of the house. So hopefully they wouldn't burn. And he put her purse in the car so that that wouldn't burn. Yeah. And then he took the couple's pregnant dog with him because the dog would have been laying down with Don. And died, probably. Yeah. Um, took the dog that's pregnant hunting. I'm sure that dog wanted to be anywhere other than hunting. 
Maybe. I, I don't know. So from there, you know, after he left, he met up with two other church um, members that he had planned to go hunting with. So the year leading up to Don's murder was filled with warning signs just all over the place. And they were ignored by everyone in their tight knit little community of their church and family members. Nobody paid attention to any of the signs that, that were being shown. Everybody, every one of these people, I believe, can hold some responsibility to how this ended up. Yeah. And I know that's a very... It's it's a broad claim to make, mm -hmm. but especially in a church community, when you see wrong and you don't speak up, you're you're to to blame. You're at fault. Yeah, I don't know. I I from very like I very firmly believe that church community, sh if it's tight knit, you have a responsibility to speak up. Yes. So while Nick was spending every free moment involved with church activities as a youth pastor with Christ Community Church. Don worked at a local credit union as a loan officer and she took care of the needs of the, the house. She cleaned, she paid the bills. She made sure that the grocery shopping was done. She made meals. She did everything. And he was usually doing something for church. She was the breadwinner in the family and um, they had just purchased their third home in January of the same year of her, of her death. It was a, um, complete fixer upper needed a complete overhaul. Yeah. The work was not getting done very fast. It was going very, you know, very slow process and it was costing them a lot of money. They ended up having to take out a second mortgage uh -huh. to cover these costs. They uh, continued this, you know, this way in their marriage, Don was making the money, Nick was spending it. And to be fair, they were very generous. It, it was said by multiple people, if they, if somebody needed something, you know, and Nick could give it to them, they would. And Don supported this a hundred percent. You know, that's, okay. that's just how they were at the expense of themselves. Unfortunately, yeah. I, I kind of want to add a side note. The dynamic of their relationship reminds me of Josh and Susan Powell okay. a lot the subservient wife to a narcissist husband who leads the family, but doesn't do any of the work. Yeah. It was like, ding, ding, ding. You, you have a winner, yeah. you know, the slight differences being that, uh, Josh wasn't regularly religious and the Hackneys did not have children. They never were blessed with children. Okay. Even though, uh, Dawn had told multiple people that she wanted children. She wanted children more than anything. Mm hmm. They were married um, about seven years, so they didn't have any. As Nick took on more and more responsibility at the Christ Community Church, he began doing counseling sessions with a few couples that were having marriage issues. Um, don't know what his qualifications were <laughs> other than he was a pastor. Yeah. And, and that's fine. I'm not saying that he wasn't qualified or that pastors in general are not qualified for that. He was not qualified. Let me correct that. He was not qualified. Okay. Eventually, those turned into one-on-one -on -one sessions between Nick and the wives, leaving out the husbands. Creepy. Yeah. Um, but Don was helping, too. Don was helping by babysitting the kids of the women that was counseling. Okay. Yeah. And while it raised some concerns, the senior pastor and the associate pastor really didn't check in on that. They let him have free reign. Yeah. And he took that and ran. The reason he had such free reign was that the associate pastor was basically staging a coup to kick the senior pastor out and take over the church. Uh, okay. Right. So Nick eventually picked sides. He, uh, you know, seized an opportunity so that he could get more power and, you know, put him in a, a more higher up position, position in the hierarchy yeah. of the church. The church definitely had some ideologies that are very specific to Pentecostal Christianity, if anybody's uh -huh. aware with that. Um, I think you know what that is, right? The Holy Rollers? Yes. Yeah. So they were affiliated with the Assemblies of God churches, but after the senior pastor stepped aside, it became more of a non-denominational setting. And like I said, Holy Roller churches, they're, they're the ones that do like the speaking in tongues, um, divination, prophecy. They do like spirit filled prayer sessions that go on for hours. It's and, and again, I don't if this is something that you, you know, anybody listening 
if this is who you're associated with, I'm not knocking it. No. I to each his own. There's there's a path of faith that everybody walks. You yes. know, walks. Yes. This particular church also did what was known as deliverance counseling, which does frighten me. The parishioners would be in a closed room with, you know, members of the board or or the pastors, and they would be um basically forced into telling any sin that they had committed. And the pastors would, you know, ask them completely, you know, inappropriate, inappropriate questions, yeah. invasive, in, invasive questions like, have you had an abortion? How many times have you had sex? Have you ever, you know, have you ever masturbated? Have you ever thought about killing somebody? Have you, you know, just questions that on a normal day, don't enter somebody's mind to think to ask about somebody and it's none of anybody's business. Yeah. And if that's a sin that you've committed, then you, you know, if you feel like that's a sin, it's up to you to ask for forgiveness. That has nothing to do with your pastor no. unless you want to involve them in that. But what they would do is record all of this. They would write it down. They would record it and they kept this information. And then they basically would do uh, you know, what they considered like a counseling session where they exercised all the demons out and, you know, would help you get closer to Christ. You know, this also sounds like uh, part of that Leah Remini uh, story about Scientology, where they would yes. interview you and keep all the notes and then use it against you later. and Right. Make you confess and everything. So Right. Because, I mean, ultimately... Everything you could go through your day and everything that you've done that's so inconsequential. Yeah. It could be considered a sin. Yes. So at the end of the day, how shitty do you feel about yourself? Oh, yeah. Because you couldn't make it through the day without committing one small sin. And and then for somebody else to have that information that they know about you and hold it over you or potentially hold it over you. I, I can't imagine the, the feel good. <laughs> No. Part of that, no. you know, and and what about that is Christ like? That's my question about yeah. it. Where do you get off on that? So with all this chaos going on, it's really no wonder that Nick got away with what he got away with. Yeah, nobody was paying attention to him, and when they were, it was almost too late, and they kept thinking, "Oh no, not Nick, not oh. not this guy, no, not Bob the Baker, right?" <laughs> so when anybody questioned it, they were told that God wanted it this way. Oh, okay. Right. And here's another big problem I have with this. And I don't have a problem with religion as a whole. Again, everybody walks their own walk. Yeah. Do not ever excuse what you're doing in the name of God. Correct. Ever. So not surprising, Dawn hadn't been involved much in Nick's activities. Um, she was a very devout Christian and she supported him fully, but she seemed to be out of the loop with the congregation. He was definitely a one show man, like the, what do they call it? One show pony. Yeah. One trick pony. One trick pony. Um, he was definitely, you know, the man on the scene and she was just there to support him yeah. and, and do what he needed. There were three couples that Nick was giving counseling to, or more specifically three wives. There was Sandy, Nicole and Annette. And I, I hesitated to name them by name or to change their names, um, but their information is out there. I, I'm not giving information that isn't already, if anybody wants yeah. to read this book or watch any of the videos that I watched or read any of the newspaper articles or anything, this information's out there. So I'm, I don't feel bad about giving it. So in the year leading up to Don's death, Nick set the stage perfectly for these women to like garner support from them and develop holds over them so that when it came time for his plan to go through, no one was the wiser. And the first affair began with Sandy, the church secretary, while Don was still alive. Although it would be years before their true relationship became known, it was sexual in nature, as well as emotional and spiritually abusive. So she was considered a prophetess of the, sh the church. So she was thought to have a direct link to God. She had visions and okay. they were so accepted that they often made their way into the church bulletin. Oh, wow. Like, oh, by the way, Sandy says this this week. <laughs> and it was just a completely normal thing. And people would listen to her. And I'm, I don't know whether she was right or wrong a lot of the time. I don't know whether this is a true thing for her. I, I definitely can't discredit that there are people that have um, that gift, if you want to call it that. Yeah. 
Um, in this case, it it just brings in a lot of questioning. Like Lady Monica. Right, Lady Monica. Yeah. So when she spoke, when Sandy spoke, the congregation listened. And one day during one of her and Nick's, you know, quote unquote sessions, counseling sessions, yeah. she claimed that God told her of Don's death and that it was going to happen in mid-December of 1997. So that year, she also had word that her own husband was going to die. And then they would be free to be together and build their ministry. And then you had, they had dreams of being these great youth pastors and having a camp so that, you know, they could minister to, to youth in the area, in the Washington area. And, and they would be free to, to do this together and live their lives in peace and well, just, be these great super Christians. Do you know if Sandy had kids? She did. She had four kids with her husband. Okay. Yeah, she had four sons. So... Nicole was said to be in constant contact daily with Nick, possibly the closest person he had to a confidant. He would help her with her two kids and around the house, as well as the counseling that he provided her. At first, she was still actively trying to save her marriage. There was definitely this weird emotional connection that Nick like had with these women. He would find what would make them vulnerable to him and he would exploit it of course that's what a predator does exactly so then annette um was one of the last people to engage in a relationship with him and i call it that very reluctantly Mm -hmm. she um nick just seemed to know exactly what to say to her to break down break down her barrier In May of 1997, there were reports that he claimed to Annette he had been molested in elementary school by a school employee. Yeah. And she had also been a victim of this type of abuse. And so she had great empathy and sympathy for him. Yeah. And he said that this was information that he couldn't give to his wife, but that he could, he felt confident sharing with her. Yeah. So then she felt like, you know, oh, oh, I'm important. He can't discuss this with his wife, but, you know, he can discuss it with me and we can share this together. And it was uh, it was all he needed to get in and, you know, grab a hold of her yeah. to control her. So it is well known that the women were in con- counseling with Nick. He even discussed each of the other women with the one like that he was with. So while he was with one, You're he would talk about, about the other ones. Yeah. He would be complaining about how needy they were. And he, you know, would be like, oh, yeah, I know that they're in love with me and I I need to do something about that. And it it, just how unprofessional that is. Very unprofessional. If anyone began to question his methods or what he was doing, he would claim that it was, quote, it's God's work or that, quote, it's all right, because that's what they need right now. Of course it is. And he bragged of how he was helping these women. And I read a passage in some research that stated, quote, Nick was always in the company of someone else's wife. <laughs> that sucks. Sure the fuck he was. Members of the woman's families and even one husband were gaslighted into being ashamed for even questioning what Nick was doing. And upon being asked point blank why he was at their daughter-in-law's house at all hours of the night, Sandy's father-in-law claims Nick told him, quote, the Holy Spirit has instructed me not to answer you. I plead the fifth. Exactly. But by, you know, spiritual means. Of course. The higher authority always rules. Sure. As I had mentioned, there was a coup in the church that happened in August of 97 when the senior pastor, who is P.B. Smith, and his wife stepped aside to let the associate pastor take control. This is Robert, Billy, and his wife. They became the head of what they renamed Life Staff Ministries. Nick was quick to take sides in exchange for a higher position in the church. So he sided with Robert. Yeah. Except it didn't really work out for Nick because the more people who brought up their concerns with his counseling sessions Uh and behavior to Robert, the less free reign he had. So he was warned by Robert that whatever was going on wasn't right. And he would be watching them. He would be, you know, keeping an eye on him because he needed to be able to trust his second in command. Yes. And if people were, you know, he wanted more people to stay with the church so that he could blossom this into his vision. Yeah. If people were pissed off because of what Nick was doing or thought it was, you know, sketch in any way, they would leave and then he wouldn't keep his hold on the new church. Yeah. So didn't really, um, he wasn't able to fly under the radar. So Nick does an about face 
he starts to tell those who will listen that Robert um, has it out for him. Please pray for his safety and to know that God will take care of him. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Yeah. He puts doubt into everyone's minds and becomes this big martyr. And in October, when PB Smith and his wife returned from a mission they were on in Africa, Nick quickly begs forgiveness. And he says, you know, I'm so sorry for what I did um, and for how you left and things aren't going good. I thought it was going to be better, but it's not. Yeah. And just like that, he, you know, goes back to doing what he wants while the two pastors are again at odds trying to figure out the situation with the church. Okay. Meanwhile, behind everybody's back, Sandy and Nick continue to plan ahead for their respective spouse's demise. They had to be very secretive because the congregation knew that Nick had been uh, talked to in regards to their relationship. Yeah. But what nobody knew, you know, wouldn't hurt them, right? That's (laughs) what you think. The two actually ordered custom wedding bands from a local jeweler in Paulsbo. Okay. These were paid for by cash advances from two credit cards that Nick and Don had. Oh, wow. Wow. Sandy had a new clearer premonition that Don would die on December 18th. She also began telling her sons that when their dad died, Nick would be their new daddy. Just like, how is Don taking this? She doesn't know. Oh, I, well, wasn't it in the newsletter? No, that one didn't make it to the news- newsletter. That oh, was okay. a private premonition. Oh. Yeah. Uh, the one about her husband, though, does make rounds. One of the sons apparently even told his dad. Oh. Like, hey, this is what mom said. And he's kind of, by the this time, they're separated. Like, they're oh, okay. they're not, they're co-parenting, essentially, is, is yeah. the extent of their relationship. And he's mad because he knows that Nick is the one responsible for how bad it's gotten. Yeah. He may, you know, the two of them may have made it a, a bad marriage, but Nick has definitely not helped. busted this wide open. Yeah. yeah. I just don't understand how you tell one of your children, hey, dad's going to die. Yeah. And uh, meet your new daddy. Like, I, w- why yeah. would you do that? Why would you psychologically damage your child like that? It, it doesn't. I don't know. So when that date passes and Don is still alive, Sandy claims that God told her to wait and that, quote, her hands were tied. So December 18th comes and goes. Don is still alive. Not long before her death, Nicole and Annette, the women in in the counseling harem, were wondering why Don was so unhappy and sad. And they kept thinking, like, Nick is such a great husband. He's helping them with their problems. Didn't she think that he was great, too? And, you know, what what could she possibly be so sad about? Like, what could be wrong? Yeah. And I actually read that while at a baby shower for another church member, Don broke down in tears and relayed that she didn't think she was making Nick happy any longer. She didn't know what to do. This was just weeks before she died. She confessed all of this to one of the women that Nick was counseling. Hmm. Not one of these women acknowledges or seems to realize at the time that it's their own actions with her husband That are the cause of this woman's unhappiness. Oh, wow. And I feel very confident in making that statement because if you knew what you were doing was wrong, you wouldn't have fucking done it. Yeah. Not until after Don is dead do they start to to think that maybe some shit wasn't right. Yeah. When they asked Nick, he claimed to have, he was claimed to have said, quote, it's God's plan for her. It means that she's going to suffer. That's God's plan. I hate that. I do too. I re- it's cringy. All of these bullshit statements of, you know, quote, God told me or God gave me vision or God, you know, God has visited me. I don't discredit that this is a spiritual occurrence that can happen. Yeah. Whoever you worship, God or, or whatever you worship, worship can give messages. Sure. But to use that excuse as to why you are doing something unforgivable to a person, it's the highest form of self-absolution there is. Yeah. It's disgusting. It is. And it's an excuse to go about your life however you want and expect no consequences for your actions because God told you. Yeah. Or whoever told you, you know, it's okay. And then Don died on December 26th in 1997. When we come back from the break, we'll go over the day before Don's death and how this crazy fucking story plays out. 
the couple had spent Christmas Day with Don's mother and brothers, uh, Nick. Um, Nick explained, you know, why Don was so drowsy. It's because she was feeling sick and she was taking Benadryl. That night, they went to a party at the senior pastor's home, so PB, um, where a quick plan was made for Nick to go hunting at first light uh, the next morning with two of the parishioners. They went to Indian Island. It was an uneventful hunting trip that ended around 8.30, 9 o'clock. And then the three went to a small cafe for breakfast. Just as the food's coming out, Nick jumps up and he makes this quick excuse that he's got to get home. And he like forgot to do something. And okay. right. So he pays his bill um, and he books it out. Him and his pregnant dog book okay. it out of there. Um, the receipt is time stamped at 927. So, of course. So they have it like confirmed. So when Nick gets home, there are emergency services all over the neighborhood um, and in front of his house. A deputy coroner stops him from entering and notes how visibly upset Nick is by the news that they, uh, when they tell him they found remains of a female in the back bedroom. And, you know, everybody in the neighborhood, it was actually um, their next door neighbor tried to get into the house because they um, they weren't sure if anybody had made it out or if anybody was there. They didn't see the car but and they didn't hear the dogs barking because there should have been two dogs. They they are just aren't sure. So when a neighbor sees the smoke and you know notices that the, there is a fire in the house, they try to get in there, and they do notice that there is somebody in the back bedroom. But by that time, the fire is so bad that they run out and wait for emergency services to get there. So when Nick shows up, the uh, deputy coroner has already been there. Mm -hmm. They're putting out the fire still because they can't get in there yet. And he, they do know he's pretty upset when he's, you know, sees all of this. Yeah. So most of the house is damaged. It's not very solid, salvageable. Um, after the fire was put out, of course, water damage can do almost more than the fire can. Investigators found a few things that looked odd, such as, um, Wrapping paper and newspaper near an old, like, electric heater, plug-in heater. Mm -hmm. There was, uh, that's where the fire was presumed to have sparked and started. There were also some small canisters of propane on the bed, and there was paper just littered about the room. So Nick explains all of this away. They were renovating the house, and it had no heat, so they used the old heater. Yeah. That was a, you know, plug-in heater, and then they had electric blankets for warmth. The wrapping paper was from them opening presents the night before, and then they fell asleep before they picked everything up. Of course. Yeah. The propane tanks were actually part of presents that Don had given Nick um, because he liked to go camping. So she had gotten some little mini propane tanks, like kind of the ones that you would put like with a cooking yeah. or a lamp or, yeah, you know, the Coleman stuff for camping. I like sleeping with them, too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Nick says that, uh, he left in the morning, you know, before first light, he was supposed to meet these people and he turned the heater on before leaving. And that, um, as he walked out the door, he said it was about five thirty in the morning when the coroner questions why Don didn't get out of the bed. Nick has an explanation for that too. She took Benadryl. Right. She had been ill and she had been taking Benadryl and maybe she took too much or maybe it affected her weirdly. Yeah. People from the church start showing up and everybody's comforting Nick and they're asking what they can do. And Nick asks somebody to go over and tell Don's parents. It's a little odd to me that he wouldn't want to make the phone call or go over yeah. there himself. I, I can I can see. I can see both sides, I guess. I think in the end, though, and this sounds shitty, but given what he's done, he wanted to be there. He wanted to be in front of everybody as this poor grieving man. Yeah. And he was putting on a show. And if he had left that scene, nobody would have, nobody would have seen that. Yeah. yeah. So the entire investigation of this is utter bullshit. I'm going to say it really was all because Nick was a local pastor. I honestly, I, I think that is why nobody even suspected to think that anything didn't match up. Okay. To me, 
nobody wants to come out and accuse a man of God that he killed his wife. Yeah. And I, I honestly think that's why he got away with things for so long. So the Bremerton PD left it in the hands of the fire department to do the investigation. And the fire department then said, well, let's just have the home insurance adjusters do the investigation. Of course. Only a few photos are taken of the scene. Uh, They're not really showing exactly what needs to be shown. And these photos aren't even scrutinized until months, a couple years after the fact. So they're they're there, put in a folder and left and forgotten. Okay. Um, when he was questioned at the Bremerton Police Department, it was just a formality. They they asked him if he killed his wife. He says no. That's good enough for them. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Yeah. We're good. They ask him about the days leading up to Don's death and they don't find anything out of the ordinary. He claims he was hunting. Um so that you know, morning. They decided it was bad. They called it quits a little early. He left in a hurry from the cafe because he, quote unquote, forgot something. The police never ask him what he forgot. Yeah, what he forgot. Right. What is it you forgot that was such a, a important thing? He had to jump up and, and get home. They also never talked to the p- two people he was with that day. Never got statements. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, when they, you know, when he left the police department, he went straight to Nicole's house that day. And a congregation member would give an account in my research that I read that Nick called this person the day um, that he had been questioned. And he apologized if Don's death ruined her son's birthday party and that he had a gift for her son. Well, no need to stop life that his his wife died. You know what I mean? Sure. I guess. I just don't know why that's your main concern. There again, I do think all of this can be explained away. To me, now it's it's shady. Um, at the time, it's people making excuses because grief hits people differently. Yeah. And I, I do understand that. I don't want to, by any means, do I have all the answers of that. I know that grief affects people differently. But I also don't think that if my spouse had passed away, I'd be concerned with a birthday party for a, not anybody who re- who's even related to me. Yeah. I don't know. So that same woman claims that Sandy was afraid to go over after, you know, all of this happened to uh, the pastor's house where he was staying to give her condolences to Nick because it might look weird. And at the time they were like, why would that look weird? Why is that weird? That shouldn't be weird. You're yeah. giving condolences. He's grieving. It's weird because you're, you made it weird. <laughs> Like you have this weird situation going on. Nick would later confess to Sandy that he had suffocated Don, who had been given multiple doses of Benadryl. He suffocated her with that plastic bag. He killed her as she looked him in the eye. And to cover his tracks, he started that fire. It um, eventually burnt their bedroom down. He left on that trip and he, like I said, took care to make sure that that purse and important papers were not near the fire and he took the dog with him so that the dog wouldn't be injured. And then he went about his business and he confessed that to her. Wow. It didn't take long. No. So the church community rallies behind the widower. He goes to stay with PB Smith and his family. People brought him clothes, food, toiletries, even money in the days after all of this happened. Okay. A couple of days after Don's death, Nick is at the mall with some church members on a shopping spree. Um, He needs things. Obviously, his bedroom burnt down. Yeah. He's not buying basics. He's buying nice suits and expensive accessories to go with them because he's he's got to be, you know, outfitted correctly yeah. for whatever. I don't know. And as plans for the funeral are made, Nick is insistent that he be the one to give the eulogy. He won't let anybody else. Many other people offer to step in and do it so that he doesn't have to do it. Yeah. And he absolutely refuses to let anybody else do it. And he says it's got to be him. So when the day comes, the service is held at the same church where her high school graduation was. This is Bremerton. So it's a small community. Yeah. Everyone's there. Nick has a captive audience for his hour long eulogy. That's not just the service. That's his eulogy to her. Wow. It's an hour long. The grieving widower was in his element. I of I have course. no doubt. Yeah. Yeah. 
And it's, if you're going to make it an hour long, it's sure probably a production with pictures and music. And There were pictures. Um, a lot of people, like her mom had set up like a table of, of some memories and um, there were a lot of pictures. And I'm sure many people got up and said things. This was just him for an hour. Do I don't even, I, what would you even say for an hour? I don't know. Yeah. Right after, right after this is all done. He went to Annette and he, one of the women that he was counseling yeah. immediately after the service was done. And many people questioned, would like comment and remember how odd it was that he went right to her as she's standing by her husband and engulfed her in this huge like hug that lasted way too long. Yeah. But little, nobody says anything. A little inappropriate. Very inappropriate. So the investigation of the fire is still ongoing, but no one's really looking for real evidence to suggest it was anything other than an accident. Basically, all of, all of this was a formality. Everything was just a formality. Yeah. The fire department found extension cords running all over the house, and Nick said that's because they were in the middle of a remodel and some of the you know electrical wasn't working properly. Yeah. He claims... There weren't any papers near the space heater when he left. He doesn't know how they that got there. Maybe, like you said, they tossed him when they were opening presents. The official story of the events was that the old space heater sparked when it cycled on, burned the wrapping paper, and then it caused the propane tanks to explode in like a flash fire. And it just burned fast and hot. No one questioned why there were no smoke detectors in the home. They never questioned why a box of important papers and documents was boxed up by the front door. No one thought to ask why just days before this happened, they had given one of their adult dogs to Sandy's sons and why he took a very pregnant oh. dog out with him to hunt that day. That's right. you, I, that's, I was wondering where the second dog was. Yeah. You said there's supposed to be two, but he took the pregnant one. I was like, well, where's the other dog? Yeah, that was over at Sandy's house. Oh, okay. I don't know about Don, but if you told me you were taking one of my dogs to give to somebody else's kid, mm -hmm. I would be pissed. Yeah. I I would be very upset because it was it I couldn't see any reason why they would do that. Yeah. Maybe it was because the other dog was pregnant. I'm not sure. It didn't sound like a temporary situation. Okay. It sounded like the dog was given to them to have. Huh. So Maybe they weren't her dogs. I don't know. Maybe she had no attachment to them. I'm not sure. It just seems hella sketch. Yeah. Yeah. Lastly, the thing is nobody questioned how Don's purse was in their car and not in the house. No. Maybe, even, I mean, maybe she left it. I don't know. Yeah, but e even in my most fucked up state, <laughs> I know where my purse is. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I know that it's supposed to be in the house, you know, I, it just, yeah. I don't know. It, it seems an odd, quite odd thing that somebody should have questioned okay. to me in the week after Don's death, this sick son of a bitch actively resumed his emotional and spiritually abusive relationships with the multiple women, eventually engaging them in sexual relationships as well. According to uh, research, Nick was quoted as saying, quote, I think when you go to heaven, you can have sex with whoever you want. Okay. And that seemed to be a theme while he, you know, was here on life, <laughs> on yeah. earth, in life. From what I can tell, the relationship with Sandy stopped involving sex at that point, but it was still very, a very disturbing relationship. They yeah. relayed on each other. They definitely held each other's secrets. and. She was aware of the relationships that he was having with the other women. Okay. And he would direct those other women to use Sandy as a support system so that they wouldn't feel like they could, you know, they didn't feel like they could tell other people what was going on. Yeah. He said, talk to Sandy about it. She can be your support system. Okay. So that, you know, it all the information is kept in the circle. It's a little weird. Yeah. Very weird. So within days of the funeral, he began an email correspondence with uh, the pastor's daughter, who was just 19 years old. So PB Smith, who he was staying with. Yeah. She went to Africa on New Year's Day on a missionary trip that had been planned previous to all of this. Uh -huh. 
she was a member of his youth ministry group. And I don't know what happened in the few days after the funeral and or, you know, after Don passed away and when she left on New Year's. But they began this weird email correspondence where it quickly turned sexual in nature. Oh. And very inappropriate. When the young girl told Nick that they should, you know, be talking, they should ask her father for his blessing in yeah. all of this. Nick was like, yeah, of course, I'll I'll do that. And he did. And PB said, no way. Yeah, that's no, that's not appropriate. You just nope. lost your wife. Yeah. And Nick, to his face, said, OK, I, I get you. You're totally right. I don't know what I was thinking. Got it, buddy. Right. But they still remain, they remained in contact behind her dad's back. Of course. Yeah. Another church member gave an account that Nick showed up at her door unannounced. During their conversation, he started talking about how much he missed having sex with Dawn. Keep in mind, this is, she hasn't been gone a week. Yeah. By January 9th, he and Nicole were officially uh, in a sexual relationship. By this time, she was completely estranged with her husband and divorce papers had been filed. Nick played on her sympathy and claimed that, quote, God would allow it anytime she thought to question it. It was fine. God's going to allow this. He He's going to allow us to have this loving sexual relationship. Of course. Right. They continued on their relationship for years. And as, as if those women weren't enough, he decided he needed some sexual healing from Annette, um, who was still a married woman. In the beginning, she turned him down, telling him that it was a sin and she wasn't comfortable with it. Yeah. And Nick repeatedly made advances towards her, telling her that those who were truly attuned to God and his will knew that love could be in all different ways. And then he would tell her that, um, you know, she could really help him and it, it would be uh, just what he needs. That God's telling him this is what he needs. Then he also relayed to her that he had helped a man going through a divorce and um, that, you know, he had helped that man sexually. So if that was OK, this is OK. OK. They would engage in some sexual acts, but they wouldn't fully consummate a relationship for some time after this. But there definitely was some sexual things going on. So at this point, it's not even a month since his wife's death. Oh, Jesus. This guy's on a roll. He's having sex with at least two women in person. One by email. He's been in a relationship of some type with Sandy, who has some knowledge of what he's done and taken place in regards to Don's death. And now he's after Annette, joining in on the fun. Mm -hmm. Members of the church begin to help him get his finances in order. Um, they started helping him make a catalog of items for insurance purposes for the house. Yeah. And while at the house, he would go from crying and inconsolable one minute to perfectly fine and downright chilly the next from some accounts. On one of those days where he was there and this, you know, stuff was going on, they were trying to go through some things. Nicole found a ring that he had made, um, that he had had made for yeah. Sandy. He, she found that ring and he claimed that it was for Don, but he never got to give it to her. She thinks nothing of it. Okay. Right. On January 26th of 1998, Nick was again questioned in regards to the fire and it's uh, at this point, it's just written off as a freak accident. They claim it must have started from the faulty old heater that shot off a spark that arced and caused the propane canisters to explode. OK. When the coroner does the, an autopsy, there's no smoke or carbon monoxide in Don's lungs. They claim that her larynx closed in reaction to the smoke. And because of the Benadryl in her system, she was unable to wake up and get to safety. It's all neat and tidy. No foul play is suspected. Hmm. Even the toxicology report from the autopsy shows that she had 10 times the amount of the normal dose of Benadryl. Nobody questions it. No. Because they say the blood that was taken um, was from her heart. That was the only place they could get it from because of how badly right. her body was yeah. burned. Um, that it could be a little skewed. Okay. Right. So her cause of death is officially reported as the larynx spasm, which cuts off her airway. Mm -hmm. And with that, Nick is officially in the clear. He has nothing to worry about. The insurance is going to cut him a check and he can go about his life. Sweet. Yep. So 
The sick relationships between all these women and him continue for months after everything is ruled an accident. Eventually, Nick and Annette do consummate their sexual relationship by intercourse. Annette is struggling so much with what that means. And she actually starts to fall into like a very deep depression. Mm -hmm. And she's told when she questions it, that it's part of God's plan and it's all okay. And go talk to Sandy. Sandy's going to help you through it. Of course. Right. They actually even perform like an exorcism on Annette, Nick and and Sandy do. Uh Uh-huh. As as if this is what's wrong with her. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's not him. It's the devil. Why are you questioning him? Right. He's a pastor. (sighs) Exactly. So then Nicole starts to talk to Annette about her relationship. Oh. But Nicole doesn't know that he and Annette are having sex oh. while Nicole and he are having sex. She doesn't know this. Mm. Sandy knows everything. Yep. Annette knows that Sandy knows because Nick told Annette to talk to Sandy. Uh-huh. Nicole doesn't know about anything else. Okay. So Annette, you know, doesn't tell her that this is happening when Nicole discusses their relationship because she doesn't want her husband to get wind of this. Mm-hmm. So she only talks to Sandy about what's going on. And I think, you know, Sandy thought that if she did, if she did this, if she held this all together, that in some way, Nick and she would still end up together Mm -hmm. maybe. And their plan would move forward. I'm not sure. What has to be the most disturbing thing in all of this is that Nick contacts Don's mother. Um, they, he goes without getting a headstone for her. He actually never gets a headstone for Don. Oh. A group that is like a charity organization mm-hmm. actually ends up putting a headstone on her gravesite for her. Oh, good. So, I, yes, it's good that it happens. But, you know, Nick supposedly had contacted Don's mother, Diana, or Diane. Mm-hmm. Um, he asked her, hey, do you want to come over and look at the house and see what we've done with it because it, it, by this time he's starting to you know clean it up so he can get ready to sell it yeah and she doesn't really want to but she's like okay sure they get over to the house and it's upsetting for her obviously and in the backyard he has this yurt up and you know tent up in the backyard uh-huh. that he would take on his camping trips or the, his plan was to use that for like his youth ministry yeah. they end up having sex what the fuck? With the mom. Okay. With his dead wife's mom. I mean, that's that's some good talking. I don't know how he convinced her to do that. I don't either. And it's, it's very sad. She felt like it. she was grieving. And she felt like, you know, she wanted to give him a part of Dawn back because <sighs> he was grieving too. What is in the water in this town? I don't know. I don't know. I From what I could find, it was only the one time. Just, I'm physically ill at the thought. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Then we have the email relationship that was still going on. On his end, it kind of fizzled out after about six months because there wasn't any physical contact. You know, she's in Africa. Africa. But whatever. He gets to Africa. He goes there at the end of 1998 on a mission trip with a couple other people. And they do initiate a sexual relationship while he's there. And then he tells her that there can't be anything more. And he, he actually is no longer interested after he's already had sex with her. Okay. Yeah. So he leaves Africa and and that's the end of that. So all of this carries on between, you know, the three women, primarily the three women, not the mom, not the email relationship um, for years. Eventually, Nick and Nicole an- announce that the two are going to be married, and they start setting a date. Uh-oh. Right. Annette's mental and physical health deteriorated so much that she decides to get actual counseling um, and eventually decides that when her husband says, let's move, should we move closer to your family in Oregon? She says, hell yeah, let's get the fuck out of here. Yes. And she recognizes that this is pretty much the only way that she's going to get away from this situation. Oh, good. Yeah. So Sandy also begins counseling, um, but it didn't quite help her the same way. She actually became very like resentful. Mm -hmm. Um, She eventually begins to date a former high school sweetheart. By now, her and her husband have completely dissolved their relationship. Yeah. And he's still alive, by the way. He he, he didn't die. Okay. 
So people have been, you know, really been noticing odd behavior with Nick in the church and how he interacts with women. And after Nick, you know, switched back to PB Smith's side in the pastor wars, yeah. Robert uh, Billy was so convinced that Nick was involved in his wife's death and he, you know, had been carrying out affairs. He wasn't quite sh- sure with who mm-hmm. he thought Sandy for sure. Yeah. Maybe Nicole didn't know anything about Annette. Um, he actually had been tailing Nick. <laughs> Oh, like following him. That's your detective. Yes. He just, he was not happy about being double crossed and he, he definitely was going to try to find out what the fuck was going on. Yeah. He sent a letter to the police department with some information saying, Hey, you really need to look at this guy. And, uh, they, they actually kind of pay attention. It's very interesting. So then the shit hits the fan. Um, Annette decides to tell her husband what had been going on. She actually ends up having another child. It's not Nick's. It is her husband's. But she cannot carry the guilt of this relationship anymore. And she tells him that Sandy and Nicole also had affairs with Nick around the same time. Oh. And he's livid. He calls up the pastor. Uh, he is calling a board meeting with the church. Yeah. Everybody's going to fucking know this by the time he's done. Good for him. So it wasn't long before every member of the former Christ uh, Christ Community Life Ministries, whatever you want to call the church now, because uh-huh, it's yeah. had three names at this point. He, you know, they're all aware. Nicole stands by Nick. Their wedding is still being planned. Mm -hmm. Nick apologizes for his actions, but as word gets out, many women come forward with stories about how uncomfortable he made them or instances of encounters with him throughout the church. Yeah. Now that the affair is out, in order to protect herself, Sandy tells her new relationship, her new beau, the entire sordid story. Even what... Nick confessed to her about him killing Don. Oh. She tells him of the love affair, the weird sexual love triangle, rectangle, I don't know, yeah. whatever you want to call it. And that, you know, she knew what Nick had told her about that. And he convinces her to hire a lawyer and go, you know, speak to somebody about yeah. this to make sure that, number one, that she, uh, you know, can save her own ass. But number two, so that this information gets out, because if he really did this, he should be in jail. Oh, yeah. So on June 12th, 2001, she met with Kitsap County prosecutors so that she could give a statement about all she knew regarding the death of Don Hackney. In exchange for her info, she was given immunity from any charges. Okay. So now the people, you know, police are feeling pretty foolish yeah. <laughs> about having let this man go free this whole time. Oh, yeah. They start to really look into his story, the timeline, what little evidence was kept which thank God they actually kept yeah. some of that stuff. It, just just the few things that they kept, if they had actually scrutinized them then, they would have known that shit wasn't right. Yeah. But they kept it. That's all that matters. Come to find out the canisters never actually exploded. They're intact. Oh. Nobody caught that. <laughs> Nobody caught that this whole time. They look rough because they've been in a fire, but they aren't leaking. They're intact. Mm. Nobody thought to to look into that. No. Right. Whenever they go over these photos that have been taken, investigators notice that paper has been stuff all along Don's upper body in the bed. Oh. She was covered with what burnt down was a, a electrical blanket. So all you see is the wires. This is the 80s so yeah. or 90s. All you see is the wires. They weren't very great. You know, yeah. <laughs> they weren't like now today. So you see the wires of this uh, electrical blanket on top of something on a bed. You can see that along her torso, she underneath, there was burnt up pages of like newspaper, wrapping paper, any paper, book paper, just any kind of paper that he could find in the house was not shoved not underneath her torso. Not unusual. I like to sleep on paper, too. Yeah. Um, what also nobody, and this is a, a detail that is a little, it's sad, but her arms were burnt off. 
nobody paid attention to why only her arms would have been completely burnt off. Yeah. If the torso is burnt but still intact and the arms are not there anymore. Yeah. Why? That that's because that's where fire was started. Started, yeah. So it's these things that somebody should have noticed. Yeah. Somebody should have put together. The coroner should have been asking, why is her torso burnt but intact? Yeah. With no arms. Especially these experts. Right. And I, I don't know, for whatever reason, I don't know why that didn't mean something to them. Yeah. It definitely makes me question. <laughs> definitely. When I read that, I was like, what? what do you mean she has no arms left? Yeah. Why? Why is that? Will this make sense? So also they start looking at the timeline is way off. When they finally talked to the two people that he was with that day, Uh Nick had claimed he left the house around 530, but then he changed it in another, uh, you know, confession or or recount of of what's happened. He changed it to 5 a.m., but actually he probably left closer to 645. Keep in mind, it's winter. Yeah. Sun first light doesn't hit at 5 a.m. in the winter. No. So for him to say we were meeting at first light, I left my house at 530. No, you didn't. No, No, you didn't. Nope. So they they are assuming that he left probably around 645 in the morning just after setting the fire. And then uh, he would have had just enough time to make it to where he said that he met them. And that was around 7, 715. That's that is the timeline. Yeah. If they had looked at it. At that time, probably would have realized he added, you know, almost two hours to his to his time for what? Yeah, yeah. And the pull or the uh, fire emergency services showed up at seven thirteen. So if he set the fire at six forty five, that's a good thirty minutes of burning. Yeah, before anyone even before started. yeah. So on September 12th, 2001, Nick Hackney was brought into custody by Bremerton police and he was charged with first degree murder. Of course, he denied all of the allegations. Of course. He was claiming that the people in his church were out to get him. Of course they were. It's the church. Yeah. Yeah. The case went to trial. Um, Sandy and others testified as witnesses. She was basically the key star witness. And on December 26, 2002, five years to the day of her death, Dawn's murdering husband was convicted of aggravated homicide. He was sentenced to life in prison without parole initially. In 2007, he won an appeal, and that was with the state Supreme Court. The sentence was changed to 26 years and eight months of prison time, of which he had already been serving some time. 26 years. How'd they come up with that? Because they could no longer add the aggravated charge. Um, the av- aggravated meant that he, um, it was due to the arson. Yeah. So he. How about just murder? Well, exactly. That's the thing. And it was obviously planned. Yeah. He planned this. So I'm not sure. I do understand the loophole, though, where he found. Yeah. You know, the appeal to to take the aggravated off. I understand that that portion, because in order to do that in regards to the arson, he would have had to have caused the murder by setting the fire. He did not. He caught he caused the murder first and then set the fire to explain why she was dead. But it the fire did not result in her death. That whole this whole thing has just been fucked up for sure. Yeah, for sure. Whoever the D.A. was to. Charging him not with murder, but aggravated. Well, that's the thing is he was charged with first degree murder when he was arrested. I don't understand how it got. I believe that they thought that the aggravated homicide would hold more weight. And that's why they did that. But again, he the aggravated was not. It it just wasn't the right charge in all of this because the murder wasn't the result of the fire. She was already dead. Yeah. Yeah. So Nick is now going to be eligible for parole in 2025. Sweet. Yeah. Um, But we're not done. Uh Uh-oh. But wait, there's more. There's more. 
So our friend Nick is a very busy man in prison. He's been featured in articles in BioCycle magazine, and he's a teacher in the vermiculture program through the University Beyond Bars um, that, you know, is a, a program that allows inmates to get an education. Uh-huh. One of the very first things that comes up when you Google Nick Hackney is a recording of a TED Talk that he gave in 2014. Okay. About prison sustainability and environmental concerns. Sure. He, he, yeah. The inmate known as, quote, the worm guy gave a 20 minute talk on a program that has been initiated at the Monroe Correctional Complex and helping to reduce food waste by using worms to aid in com- composting and creating soil. So he's in the spotlight again. He's like the the main face for this what if he uh he's not going to be a church guy anymore he's going to be a environmental composting guy now i i mean apparently this is his life's work he's he's in his prime and he's loving every minute of it sure and the message the program they're great that's great unfortunately for me it's the messenger that's tarnishing it this wasn't just, and I watched it all the way through. I watched some other things that, um, videos that have him. You watched and his TED Talk? I watched his TED Talk. <laughs> um, and I watched another video where he was like the, I don't know, leader of a symposium. And I read articles that he co authored and I, I read on this program. It's, it's a great program. It yeah. really is. Um, but for for him, this wasn't just a talk about worms. This was a sermon, plain and simple, his TED Talk yeah. on prison reform. And here's the thing. I could honestly agree with everything that he said. Mm-hmm. I really could. It's just knowing what his crime was. Yeah. And watching him talk about second chances, it really pissed me off. It made me so angry to watch that. Yeah. It's cringy. Yeah. Which is unfortunate because I am a believer in prison reform for rehabilitation, not just incarceration. Yeah. There are some prisoners and some members of society who cannot be reformed. That's correct. Some of them have mental illnesses. Some of them are never going to be apologetic for the crimes that they did. Some of them don't want to have that second chance. They want a second chance to go out and do more. And that's fine. That's what prison is for as well. But for the prisoners who are there who do want to reform, who want to better their lives, who want to break the cycle of not, you know, having the means to deal with their life and ending back up in prison, those people deserve that rehabilitation. They deserve that reform. Yeah. And I do feel that it's important that we look at that. But for him to give that message to me, made me angry that I held the same beliefs that he was speaking of. Yeah. And I didn't like that feeling. So yeah, that's out there. He may or may not, you know, continue with that work when he's out. If he gets parole, he's eligible. doesn't mean he's going to get it, but you know, given all these great things that he's put himself out there that he's doing and he's attached his name to, mm. I have no doubt he's going to get paroled. Yeah. That man has a Ted talk. I right. feel so unaccomplished. I, well, you better figure it out. <laughs> if, if, if that's all it takes. Uh, no, it doesn't. <laughs> I, I'm just saying, I, I, I think it's a weird way for him to dispose of new bodies. I mean, it could be, <laughs> It could be. I mean, let yeah. let the worms eat it. Yeah. And I mean, that's what they do anyways. So there we have it, friends. Season two is done. Are you um, sad? I am kind of sad. Yeah. But Don't. also I'm looking forward to what the fucks. Don't worry, honey. There's a season three. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Season three is coming. It's coming. Yeah. I don't know. This 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 one was uh 
cringy all the way through. I just, I, that's just the best word that I can, yeah. can use. It, it definitely was. It's just the amount of brainwashing this guy did. Yeah. I mean, already you have to be charismatic to be a public speaker of any kind, whether it's a politician or, mm-hmm. you know, a, a priest, a pastor, uh, any kind of public speaking, you have to be charismatic in it. Persuasive. Very much. Yeah. yeah. You have yeah. to get a group of people to agree with you on your ideology or whatever you're speaking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and it definitely gets used for bad purposes. I don't want to say evil, but bad purposes more than it gets used for good purposes. Uh, yeah. I I think... If if you are somebody that is of the Christian persuasion, you do believe that there are like fruits of the spirit and and being a leader, having that kind of uh, persuasion and charismatic, that is definitely what some people would consider a fruit of the spirit. And it's just unfortunate that is it is the most twistable um, ability for somebody to have. And yeah. that's why I, I uh, this is like a cult to me. Because you have somebody who was able to twist around things so much that you had women having sex with you Mm -hmm. who were trying to save their marriages. That's why they came to you in the first place. They wanted to save their marriages and they ended up having sex with you. And only one of those women ended up still with her husband. Yeah. It's absolutely disgusting. Silver lining, honey. What's the silver lining? She stayed with her husband. One out of the three. One out of the, th- well, five. Five. Okay. The one w- one wasn't married, the email. Yeah. The mother-in-law, uh-huh. she, her and her husband had problems before all of this and that they ended up separating. So yeah, one out of five. <laughs> These are just the ones that we know about. So exactly, that's the problem here. Is there's obviously more women that came forward, so that you know that had stories. Maybe, maybe just had more to that story than they were willing to share. It's just crazy to me that he's not married in prison either. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that he is married. He married Nicole <laughs> in oh. 2006, and they're still married. And they're still married, as far as I know. Okay. Never mind. All yeah, my questions thank, have been answered. Thanks for bringing that up. I, I apologize. I, I meant to I meant to say that. Mm. I, I forgot. You're withholding information from you. I just, there's a lot. <laughs> there was a lot here. And it, it all, it all gets jumbled in my head. Mm. This is why you should have some of this information too. Sure. All right, so we will be back in a couple of weeks with our one year potiversary episode. <laughs> potiversary. And potiversary. And uh, the what the fucks. Don't miss us too much in our off time. And everybody's, everybody's sad. Yes. Yeah. Uh, if nothing else, if you can, you know, catch up on any episodes that you missed, share us with anyone you think might like us, uh, rate or review, give us five stars, gives us the opportunity to grow what we're doing. And the more notice we get, the more we can do. We really have enjoyed this season with you guys. Cannot say thank you enough yes, to all you. of the listeners that we have from all over the world, just everywhere. Yes. And anybody who supported us, we just greatly appreciate you, whether you know it be somebody we don't know or somebody that we're very close with. It all means the same. It all means a lot. Yes. So thank you. And until next time. Take care, stay home, stay safe, mask up, be kind to one another, and above all else, stay out of the woods. Stay out of the woods. We'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.